Hello and welcome to week two of contemporary art. This is the second lecture for week two, so you should already have listened to the lecture about post-war art in America. And today we're going to look briefly at a few artists who are working in Europe at this time, the immediate post-war period, and uh, mostly in England and France, and we'll also look briefly at the art of Japan right after World War II. First, we're going to look at Europe, and we're really going to only look at two countries. Obviously, there are more countries in Europe, but I just sort of want to make a general, um, some general observations about a couple of places where the trends are, the trends in art are happening really all over Europe, but we're going to look at specific cases, I guess. So in France, we're going to look at a movement that gets several different names, Takism, Stainism, translates as Stainism, sometimes also known as art informel, that is art without form, not art, in, not informal art, but art without form. Also sometimes this is called uh, un art autre, an art, another art, or lyrical abstraction. It is very, in some ways, related to what's going on in abstract expressionism in the states, but also there are specific philosophical currents and underpinnings of the art that's going on in Europe that, I mean, it resonates with what's happening in America, but it's maybe a little bit different. In England, we're really only going to look at one painter, but a guy who belongs to the so-called School of London. This is a group of painters who emerge right after the war and who have really similar concerns about pain and suffering and futility and um, existentialism and things like that. And important concepts that you'll be learning about today and that there are some discussion of, uh, of this stuff in your Hopkins book too. The philosophical position of existentialism, which is very, uh, I mean it's developed starting in the 19th century, but really in the post-war period it's authors like Albert Camus and uh, philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre who really formulate a existentialist view of life that is very influential for lots of people, and it resonates with people, again, in the aftermath of World War II. Really, I mean, I think it was Sartre who said, the only question that you have every day of your life when you wake up in the morning is whether or not to commit suicide that day. Uh, as you might imagine, that's a sort of bleak-sounding proposition, but his idea was that life is essentially absurd and meaningless and you have to make the choice to keep going in the face of that basic fact, okay? Uh, and so that is something that will be an important idea for a number of the artists that we look at. And another philosopher to be aware of is this guy Georges Bataille who is actually he started out before the war he was he hung out with the surrealists a little bit in the 20s and 30s but the surrealists thought he was a little too um, I guess you might say deviant, uh, and so he eventually kind of went on his own way. I put one reading from Georges Bataille that I'm only recommending, I'm not requiring, because it's a little bit dense, uh, but it's a, <coughs> excuse me, it's a interesting reading called The Cruel Practice of Art that talks about the role of pain and suffering in not just life, but also in the creative act and also in the, um, product of creative artists. And so he's another one who I think as you look at some of the people we study, you'll see why a guy like Georges Bataille became very interesting to uh, a number of artists, in particular to Francis Bacon, who we'll look at, who's the School of London paper, painter we'll look at. Okay, so we're going to start in France, and we're going to start with this painter who is working during the war, actually, and then immediately after the war, and developing a new kind of, uh, a new for him kind of style. This is one of his series that he did starting in the late 40s called um, The Head of a Hostage. So there's an entire Tete d'Otage series, Head of a Hostage series. I'm just showing you one of them here. This one from um, 47. This is a prime example of this stainism, uh, art without form, um, lyrical abstractions. This is a, pa a painting that's very dense and very tactile. It's a little bit hard to tell in this slide, but it's actually built up with layers of plaster 
and in some cases he would use paper mache or he'd put sand in the painting so that he would get a very three-dimensional sculptural effect on the surfaces of his paintings and a very fleshy kind of effect. The idea that he had was to try to encapsulate and express some of the feelings he was having at the time. Now it's important to know Jean-Paul Fautrier lived outside of Paris uh, and he lived very close to a part of or a part of Paris where the Nazis were occupying Paris and actually he lived very close to a, a prison that they had uh, created. So they had occupied a building and turned it into a place where they took prisoners of war. During the war, Fautrier could hear what was going on. It was not very far from his house. He could hear when people were being tortured. He could hear when people were being shot and executed. A couple of times walking through the woods by his house, he came upon the bodies of people who had been executed and dumped in the woods by the Gestapo, by the Nazi police. And it was that really horrific experience that influenced this whole head of the hostage series that he starts on uh, right in this immediate post-war period, trying to vent his rage and express his anguish over what had happened and also to give a kind of visual expression to this feeling of the absurdity and cruelty and helplessness of life, you know. Uh, as you can see in this head of the hostage where you have the hint of a mouth and the hint of an eye and what looks like if you start to think about it, it is an oval shape, right? You can see slashes of what suggests um, blood right smeared across the face a broken nose um, the the effect of war torture and execution on the human body I think one of the things that I've never been to war myself but one of the things I understand from having read the writings of people who've actually been through these kinds of situations is one of the most disturbing things about wartime is the way that human beings are reduced to meat, you know, um, by mechanical devices or by warfare or by torture or what have you. And so that seems to be at the very heart of what Fautre is trying to express and expel in this uh, Head of the Hostage series. Here's another example from that Head of the Hostage series here again. You can see it's fairly abstract, but there is a hint in there of the same kind of thing. Uh, a bloody gash, maybe exposed skull, a fleshy, built-up texture to the painted canvas. Um, although it's an abstract image, it is very evocative of these ideas, and it's meant to capture some of those ideas. He also did printmaking as well as, uh, and lithography as well as doing paintings, and this is from a series of prints he did, The Executed, and here again, fairly abstract, uh, the figures boil down to real sticks there, except that you can see where he's got the exposed rib cages of this group of bodies that he had come across in the woods behind his house. These were very, very, the series uh, of hostages that he did and the executed that he did was very widely acclaimed when it was first exhibited in Paris. As you might imagine, he was not the only person in France who had been through this horrific experience. And so this seemed to be, for people, a new kind of expression of the horror and terror and, and awfulness of the um, experience of World War II. It gave voice to people, it gave, it gave a visual expression to the anguish that people had been feeling. Here's a sculpture he did um, <clears throat> at the beginning of this series. It's called Head of a Hostage. What it is is basically a lump of lead, mol molten lead, that has a vague shape that is a little bit like a human head but maybe a human head that's been bashed in, a human head that has been decomposing. It's also made of lead, so it's very, very heavy and dense. And lead is a toxic material. It's something that can kill you. It is a base material, you know. Um, 
It's the thing that people were always trying to turn into gold in the Middle Ages, um, a non-valuable material that they were trying to turn into something valuable. I think you can probably also see why this style that Fautre is working in gets the name an other art. So it's something different, right? Or an art informal, art without form. It's a, a big lump of lead. It's not really sculpted into an actual human figure. It's evocative of other things, but it's an essentially abstract piece. And I think you can probably see too, just from this quick tour through Fautrier, that there are different concerns that are really at the heart of what's going on in art informel, uh, somewhat different than the American abstract expressionism, simply because we're talking about people who have just come through a different part of the World War II experience than people like Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, who were about the same age as a guy like Jean-Paul Fautrier, but had not been on the battlefront, had not been on the, um, on the receiving end of some of this stuff. One last print done by Jean-Paul Fautrier. This is a, a little kind of weird squiggly abstraction, as you can see. It gets the title in 1960 of Baby Mine. Uh, its original title was Le Seine et le sexe de la femme, which means the breasts, the female breasts and sex. Well, either way, I think you can look at this and see how, yeah, it is a kind of typical of Fautrier, abstract, you know, lumpy looking piece, but then if you start looking at it, you can see where it might be evocative of breasts, it might be evocative of a womb, or a fetus, or genitalia, um, even though it's this sort of amorphous amoeba-like shape. Here again, this is something where, you know, there are cognates with what's going on in America. You've got de Kooning interested in these archetypal images of femaleness in that series of women that he creates uh, that are exaggerated and distorted. But here, Fautre focusing literally on bits and pieces and turning those into these abstractions. Another artist who gets lumped into this category of art informel, art without form, is a man named Henri Michaud. And this is one of his, it's slightly later than some of the works we've looked at, uh, a painting called Chinese Ink Drawing, well, from the early 60s. And here, this is a painting that has very similar concerns, and a painter who has very similar concerns to the abstract expressionists, although he goes through a slightly different process to get there. First of all, Michaud actually spent some time traveling through Asia where he became familiar with the process of painting, um, the traditional process of painting in China using um, ink and brush on paper or silk. Uh, and he became familiar with concepts that were ancient in China with the idea that your immediate personality is transmitted literally like down a telegraph wire from your brain through your shoulder through your hand through the brush onto the paper or silk that you're painting and so this for him was a revelation here's a new way to approach painting in the case of china um, that was believed to be expressed in calligraphy in the calligraphic brush stroke uh, for michaud he took that to be something that he could transpose into these drawings that were somewhat like surrealist automatic drawings where you just don't try not to think about it, um, try to record what you're doing. It also has some similarities, of course, to Jackson Pollock. Um, <coughs> Michaud also, by the way, used, and he's not alone in this, although this wasn't something that the abstract expressionists did as much. They like to get drunk. But uh, Michaud experimented with using hallucinogens like mescaline to achieve a state where he would transcend his rational mind and be able to really express his subconscious. So his, uh, he used mescaline and other hallucinogens to try to get himself to a place where he could truly express his subconscious, also using these um, non-Western methods of painting to try to achieve a kind of deep internal I expression. And here's another one of his ink drawings from this period where he's uh, experimenting with that idea. And here you can see there are certainly elements in this that are evocative of figures, 
but he's trying to, by taking these various roots, get beyond rational expression to something deeper. And of course, if you look at this too, you could also think of this as being a little bit like developing a, a primitive language, um, a little bit like early pictographs in Chinese, or a little bit like the cave paintings at places like Lascaux. So that is where Michaud is coming from. And here again, there are formal similarities with what's going on in the work of Jean-Paul Fautrier, formal similarities with the abstract expressionists, and some similarities and differences in their underlying philosophy about how they're trying to accomplish these things. And there's just another example, uh, Henri Michaud, a mescaline drawing from 1960 where you can see this is he's uh, literally this is a drawing he did under the influence of mescaline and I suppose you can look at this and see it forming the shape of a stingray it may be evocative of female genitalia um, it may have different universal sorts of symbolism that that's what he was trying to get at you know was trying to get beyond traditional representational stuff and get to some sort of um, deeper consciousness Also in this post-war period, there are, this is a French-Canadian painter, who, uh, Jean-Paul Riopelle, who moved to Paris and then became part of this lyrical abstraction, art informel, stainism or Takism movement. And I think you can probably see why this group is called the stainist group as well, right? Smearing paint or, um, or ink onto canvas or paper, um, creating blobs of color, uh, things like that. And here, of course, Riopelle, in perspectives is doing an oil painting on canvas akin to what's going on in New York with um, with the abstract expressionist but he is a uh, and, and he also experiments with dripping and splashing paint onto the canvas and in this case he moves on to paint using the palette knife so this is a painting in which he's abandoned traditional tools for applying paint to the canvas and he's also abandoned the methods of Pollock and he's taken you know he mixes his paints with the with the palette knife and then quickly slaps them onto the canvas so you get this kind of blocky choppy application of paint uh, building up a very thick textural surface and here like the abstract expressionist of course one of the things is that this is meant to be in and of itself a work of art, not meant to reflect anything else or, you, you know, like a color field painting, same thing, right? It's meant to be an experience in and of itself. Our next Takist or Stainist or Lyrical Abstractionist is a man named uh, Jean-Paul Dubuffet. And Dubuffet here is uh, represented by a painting called Large Black Landscape. And that's literally Grand Paysage Noir in French, literally, large black landscape. And you can see it's got some outlines of buildings, and then he's taken the butt end of the paintbrush and scraped away some of the paint to incise lines into the surface of the paint, so using a fairly um, non-standard approach to painting. And then you've got, what, a sun up there in the sky. Dubuffet is actually um, important because he also introduces this idea and actually starts a whole art collecting and study movement known as Art Brew, that is Art, A-R-T, Brew, B-R-U-T, B-R-U-T, Art Brew, that is French for raw art. Dubuffet, like so many other painters in this time and so many other uh, uh, artists in this time, is really interested in getting beyond civilization and beyond all the stuff that basically led up to World War II, getting, oh, stripping away all of that stuff and getting to the subconscious or the unconscious. And for Dubuffet, partly he did this by pioneering these kind of techniques that are a lot like Jean-Paul Fautrier, where you have a very thickly built up surface, you might put non-traditional materials in the painting, you might scratch away at the painting, adopting a, uh, in, in Dubuffet's case, a deliberately naive style, or by painting in the case of, um, um, well, Faudrier and others, including de Kooning, iconic so-called primitive image, the idea of uh, images like the idea of woman with a capital W or um, things like that, right? Dubuffet also took this in another direction with Art Brew. He became very interested in the idea that 
people in insane asylums continued to create art. And if they're already crazy, they have already given up on the shackles of civilized behavior. Therefore, in his theory, they may create an art that is more honest and more true. He also liked what he called primitive art, that is, art from non-Western cultures, art from pre-industrial cultures, art from places where he thought of the people as being less overburdened with civilization. Now, if you take in any other like European 20th century art courses, you'll recognize this is a, a phenomenon known as primitivism, this kind of fetishizing people who are not uh, Western Europeans as being somehow more childlike and more um, free and unfettered by civilization and less, uh, you know, n less psychologically burdened. Uh, and that certainly was true for the way Dubuffet thought about these um, non-traditional artists. So he liked the art of the insane, the art of children, for all the all for the same reasons: the art of the insane, children, non-Westerners, and untrained artists. You know, the kind of people who do folk art, the kind of people who do yard display art. He really was the forefront of this whole movement. I mean, it continues to be a, a study, an area of study and specialty. And there are even museums now devoted to what is called outsider art art that is created outside the mainstream of art traditions and the art world. And here you can see how that's playing out also in Jean Dubuffet's own work. This is super vieille, that is super old, large banner portrait. This is, again, 1940s. Uh, oh, and AIC just means this is also in the Art Institute of Chicago, so you can go see this up close and personal if you are interested in it. This. <coughs> Excuse me. This image um, looks, you know, like the kind of thing you might expect a child to create, right? It's a sort of simplified, naive looking, almost stick figure painting. It also is, like these other Stainist artists, a very tactile painting. The surface is very, very built up using, um, using pigment, paint, sand, tar, sometimes um, pebbles, glass, or string, uh, a really kind of crusty, thick, textural surface, deliberately meant to not be pretty, deliberately trying to get to some sort of pre-verbal, pre-civilized aesthetic. Uh, and here's a quote from Dubuffet to get an idea of where he's coming from. Ideas strike me as a kind of outer crust formed by cooling. I try to seize mental motion at the greatest possible depth of its roots, where I'm sure the sap is far richer. So he likes this kind of idea of lava, of things in volcanoes bubbling up from below the surface. And even his paintings have this kind of effect to them, right? That they're uh, bubbling up and crusting over. Oh, in this high level of texture and very thickly laid down paint and thickly laid down tar is called the haute pâte technique, the high paste technique. This is as opposed to mezza pasta or impasta. This is incredibly thick. Dubuffet, again, here you can see same sorts of general things apply, right? So I can imagine you can start to see a little bit of a um, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of a um, pattern going on here with these post-war artists. Here, very exaggerated uh, female figure where breasts and genitals and buttocks and uh, uh, yeah, sexual parts have really been um, um, deeply overemphasized, right? Um, a childlike, naive-looking drawing. Uh, in this case, of course, not a stick figure. He did a whole series of women's bodies in the 1950s, and all of them are in this haute pâte style, this high-paced style with very thickly imply, or thickly laid in, very fleshy uh, paintings that reference these very basic ideas, okay? Um, this particular painting, and many of the paintings in this lady's body series, um, he painted by 
applying a special paste on the surface of the work that repelled oil paint and then painting with oil paint. So as the layers of paint and glaze, this oil repellent glaze dried, the, the paintings would continually kind of adjust themselves in new patterns and textures, almost like a living surface, you know, uh, replicating the idea of the bodily fluids and the circulation and the change, the uh, constant change that goes on in the human body. He said the patterns that developed in this lady's body series on these paintings Here's a quote from him, have transported me into an invisible world of fluids circulating in the bodies and around them have and have revealed to me a whole active theater of facts which perform, I am certain, at some level of life. Okay, so even trying to create a painting that mimics the activity, the circulation, the flow of uh, living bodies. So here are just a few more of these images so you can really get a sense of what Dubuffet is all about as part of this group of Unart Ultra or Stachism, which is, again, Stainism, uh, lyrical abstraction, this group in France especially um, that starts exhibiting in the post-war period. This, by the way, is a portrait of his friend Henri Michaud. Henri Michaud, remember, is the guy I was showing you who did the mescaline drawings. Uh, and had traveled to China and Japan and was very interested in alternative methods of e expression. Very much in this kind of style with the very, you know, stick figure childlike looking drawing and all of that. And then one final Dubuffet, uh, sourire or smile. And again, Dubuffet is important because he coins the term art blue which means raw art and becomes a really important category not only for scholarly investigation but also for museums also for him personally he collected raw art he um, exhibited it in museums he promoted the idea of outsider art and so he and because of all of these things that i've been mentioning so he's really uh, kind of a an important figure in the shifting boundaries of 20th century art. Well, we've talked about a couple of sculpt, or excuse me, a couple of painters from France in the post-war period, and now we're going to shift and look at another, um, another category, that is, we're going to look at sculpture, and we're going to look basically at the work of one sculptor in the post-war period. This is a guy named Alberto Giacometti, He's Swiss by birth. He ends up living in France. He is a um, student in the 20s under uh, a student of Auguste Rodin. So he is kind of in, part of the French art world. And this is one of his 1920s pieces. It's a very large bronze called Spoon Woman. And it's in this sort of, you know, surrealist abstract tradition. So uh, he's been around for a while, but in the post-war period, his style changes pretty significantly. He is deeply influenced by philosophies of existentialism. In fact, one of his closest friends is the existential philosopher and author Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, who I was telling you about earlier. So he's directly affected by Sartre's philosophies. Uh, his figures in the post-war period really start to reflect the ideas of existentialism, that modern life is devoid of meaning, that it's empty, that it's absurd. And again, this is all also influenced by the experience of having just been through World War II. There are a couple of Giacometti's figures, and there he is mimicking the pose of one of his figures in uh, his studio. So these are the kinds of figures he starts producing in the post-war period. Uh, these attenuated, incredibly elongated, very, very skeletal looking, uh, spooky, almost long bronzes. They're all figurative, but they're, they're very evocative um, in a number of ways of this idea of alienation and the ideas of, uh, of suffering and nihilism that are so much part of existential philosophy. Here's a piece that he created in 1947. So here we're talking in the period that was the same period where Jean-Paul Fautrier is creating the Head of the Hostage series. This is his nose 
from 1947 and it's this cast bronze piece that hangs from a rope inside a frame uh, and this was actually produced in a, a limited edition in the 1960s but it was created the original was created in 47 this piece should really be thought of in the context of post-war anxiety of uh, the the feelings of dread and anguish that are part of existential philosophy and this kind of you know traumatic post-traumatic stress that people are experiencing in the uh, aftermath of the war. So as you can see, nose is certainly a long nose like Pinocchio, but this shape is also very evocative. It's evocative of a skeleton, um, the you know side view of a skull. It's evocative of a person being hung by the neck on a scaffolding. It's also evocative of a gun. So it's this very basic and kind of childlike in the way of Dubuffet looking sculpture, but also one that's very evocative of all these other kinds of images of, um, of violence, of anguish, of pain, of death. And here, um, a series that he did in the later 40s called Piazza, and Piazza just means town square. So here you have people in a city walking around. These are figures that are based in a very um, huge, chunky, solid base. These figures are four men and one woman. And one thing that you can always see in Giacometti's works is his men are always striding and his women are always stationary. Okay, um, You can draw your own conclusions about the gender issues there, but that is something that we see pretty universally in his work. I think if you look at this for a minute, you can get a sense of how he's expressing in this visual form the anxiety of the post-war era. Uh, let me read you a couple of quotes from Giacometti here. One of the things he, he said was an inspiration for Piazza is just watching people walk around in the modern urban um, city. He says, in the street, people astound and interest me more than any sculpture or painting. Every second the people stream together and go apart. Then they approach each other to get closer to one another. They unceasingly form and reform living compositions in unbelievable complexity. It's the totality of this life that I want to reproduce in everything I do. As you can see, though, here, none of these folks make eye contact. None of them uh, reach each other. They're all kind of encapsulated in their own worlds. And then these long attenuated figures that are so skeletal looking of course are also quite evocative you have to think of what's going on in 47 48 49 when images of the concentration camps and victims of the nazi holocaust the you know horrific images of piles of skeletal bodies being bulldozed into mass graves that is incredibly fresh in people's minds right at this time uh also the recent dropping of the atomic bombs in Japan had produced images of people's skin being charred and falling off. And so these are all the horrific kinds of images of the effect of war on human beings that are such an immediate inspiration to, uh, in a negative sense, existential philosophy as well as to artists like Giacometti. Here's just another view of this Piazza series, so you get a sense of how these figures are not relating to one another, they're all kind of walking their own random paths, there's this feeling of disconnect and this feeling of um, loneliness that is embodied in these figures. <coughs> I will say, if you have a chance to go see Giacometti sculptures in person, they're really quite creepy. Um, they're usually six and a half to seven feet tall, very, very thin. They have a real presence to them. They really feel like you're, you know, if you see one out of the corner of your eye across a room, it can feel like there's somebody looming there coming towards you. But they're just these incredibly skinny, um, stick-like figures with a very lumpy surface. You know, it's like he took the clay and modeled these really skinny stick figures and never smoothed them out or anything like that before making the, the mold for the casting. And um, they're, they're just these evocatively skeletal, creepy figures that I think really encapsulate visually this idea of, of angst. There's one of them, as you can see, a uh, male figure striding forward. 
flat as a pancake, like a knife, actually. One of his friends said, if he ever sculpts you, he will make you look like the edge of a knife. Um, so a threatening, weird, kind of uh, praying mantis even figure. Okay, well now we're going to move on and we're only going to look at one painter in this next group, this, this group that is called the School of London. Uh, as you might expect, this is a group of English painters and they are based in the London area. And it's a group, they're not literally a school. They don't meet somewhere to, you know, have class or something like that. They are just a group of painters who are affiliated by philosophy and interest. And uh, we're only going to look at one of these guys, a man named Francis Bacon. There is another uh, really important School of London painter whose name is Lucian Freud, who is, by the way, the grandson of uh, Sigmund Freud. So there's another kind of interesting connection going on there with psychology and all these theories of the unconscious and whatnot. The School of London painters were figurative. They were interested in the same existential questions as the um, lyrical abstractionists in France and the abstract expressionists in America, but they, they believed that these things could be expressed through figurative art. And Francis Bacon is really the poster boy for this whole movement. So here you have a uh, painting he did during the war that reflects these interests, these combined interests in expressing existential anxiety, getting at the subconscious or unconscious, and doing this through the use of figurative painting. This is a, a triptych painting he did called Three Studies for Figures at the Base of the Crucifixion. They are somewhat weird looking creatures as you can see um, suggestive of anatomies of various kinds of anatomy but not any recognizable creatures they are meant to represent these figures from greek mythology known as the furies the three furies who were um, responsible for uh, avenging violations of the natural order okay so he's kind of combining mythologies here with the um, idea of the crucifixion and the idea of the Furies to get at these universal themes about life, death, meaninglessness, um, the purpose of life, and, and things like that. Here's a close-up of the figure on the right, the base of the crucifixion. And I just bring in, this is a, a typical Bacon motif, the screaming mouth, the screaming face. He was obsessed with this film from this avant-garde film from the 1920s called Battleship Potemkin. And in this one scene in particular where a nurse in this, um, in this <clears throat> during the crossfire of this battle gets shot in the eye. And um, that's a film still of Battleship Potemkin there. She's just been shot in the eye. Blood's running down her face. Her mouth is open in this anguished scream. This screaming motif became a important symbol and an important motif throughout Francis Bacon's art. It was inspired in part by things like Battleship Potemkin, also inspired by his reading of the philosopher and writer Georges Bataille, who I've mentioned before. Georges Bataille believed that suffering was the vehicle that brought you the closest to a kind of religious experience, and um, he had this actually very interesting character, Georges Bataille. He believed that deliberately inflicting suffering on someone else would help bring them closer to the divine. He was interested in sadomasochism. Uh, he actually even belonged to a society that were going to experiment with human sacrifice because they felt that this primitive ritual, okay, all these themes should start to sound familiar, you know, even though this is a little out there. Uh, this primitive ritual that civilizations had done in the past was something that would bring you, uh, the suffering experience would bring you closer to the divine. Uh, Bataille actually volunteered to be the victim in a human sacrifice for the society, but nobody was willing to be the executioner. So he um, lost out on his chance to experience that firsthand, but he wrote a lot about this kind of stuff. And his writings were very influential for Francis Bacon. Freud, or excuse me, Bacon said himself of this figures at the base of the crucifixion, it was a thing I did in about a fortnight when I was in a bad mood of drinking, and I did it under tremendous hangovers and drink. 
I sometimes hardly knew what I was doing. It's one of the only pictures I've been able to do under drink. I think perhaps the drink helped me to be a bit freer. So here again, a theme that's developed, right? This idea that you have to do, you have to do something mind altering in order to free yourself enough to get into these um, deep expressions of the inner psyche. About 10 years later, he did another series of um, a triptych for the studies of the figures at the base of the crucifixion. I'm just showing you a couple of them there on the right, and I just wanted to show you that one thing that remains a motif in Bacon's work is this idea of figurativeness, physicality, and meat. You know, I mentioned this before when we were looking at Fautrier. One of the things that's, that is so horrifying to people in wartime is this revelation that the body, the human body, is really just meat. Uh, and that kind of horror and that kind of um, revelation of the absurd is, and the meaninglessness of life, you know, is something that really um, carried over into Francis Bacon's work. <coughs> Let's see. Um, he was also, I mean, he was very interested in this idea. So let me read you a couple of quotes from Bacon. He said, I've never known why my paintings are known as horrible. I'm always labeled with horror, but I never think about horror. Pleasure is such a diverse thing, and horror is too. Can you call the famous Eisenheim altar a horror piece? It's one of the greatest paintings of the crucifixion, with the body studded with thorns like nails. But oddly enough, the form is so grand it takes away from the horror. But that is the horror in the sense that it is so vitalizing. Isn't that how people come out of great tragedies? People came out as though purged into happiness, into a fuller reality of existence. That right there is a good example of <laughs> the influence of philosophers like Georges Bataille on a guy like Francis Bacon. Deep, deep suffering brings you closer to an awareness of the beauty of life. Okay? It's a strange paradox. And again, if you're interested in this stuff and you're interested in Bacon, I, re I recommend that you try to read that Cruel Practice of Art, that, that short essay by Georges Bataille that I put into Blackboard. It's a little bit of a tough go, but it's got some interesting ideas in it. Interesting ideas about the role of the crucifixion in art and in religion, for example, uh, as well as giving guys like um, Francis Bacon a lot to think about. He also said he was fascinated by carcasses. So here's another, here's another quote from Bacon. He found he was fascinated by, and I'm quoting him here, uh, by butchered carcasses, their seductive beauty. Uh, and on the other, they serve as a solemn reminder of my own mortality. Well, of course, we are meat. We are potential carcasses, he says. If I go into a butcher shop, I always think it's surprising that I wasn't there instead of the animal. Speaking of meat... Uh, probably the most famous series that Bacon did is actually the series that starts in the 50s of these um, paintings after 16th century paintings of um, popes. So here is Francis Bacon's figure with meat from 1954. So you can recognize a couple of themes coming together in this work. It's figurative, of course, and also referencing art historical tradition. This one, by the way, is in the Art Institute of Chicago, and it's a painting that I recommend you go to the Art Institute and see because it is, it, it is an entirely different experience to see it in person than to see it reproduced digitally on a screen. So here you can see he's got two halves of a pig carcass hanging in this kind of claustrophobic-looking room behind a figure seated in a chair. The figure seated in the chair seems to have somewhat skeletal hands curled up, gripping in agony, and that screaming face. And then you can see that Bacon, it looks like he's taken something and scratched out parts of the face and scratched out some of the paint that paints the carcass. <coughs> so here you've got the, we are meat, we are carcasses, you know. Um, that existential scream, that sort of angst, the idea of suffering. And of course, this is actually t uh, taken from a, a painting of clergy, so it's also tying the